Hello, welcome back to Catholic Reboot. This topic, which I titled uh, The Pandemic of the Catholic Church, Vatican II, I titled it for a very uh, a good comparison of what we're seeing today. So today, when we look at this COVID-19 pandemic, we start to notice everything is getting reboot around this miracle virus, right? We're doing things that we never thought we'd ever do or actually put up with. We're letting things change in our culture and society because everyone's pointing to this one thing, this pandemic. So we're losing these well-established uh, rights under our constitutional republic and just giving them up, right? So giving up our freedom to assemble, our freedom of speech, our freedom to practice our faith. And it's just one after another, and we're being told, unless you comply, you know, you are illegal, right? Well, you're going to say, you compare that to Vatican II? Absolutely, because what you may remember if you came from that time is all these great traditions of our church were now being thrown out willy-nilly, and there really wasn't any good science behind it. It was uh, a group of what was considered very knowledgeable bishops and cardinals coming in and um, all of a sudden, over a three-year period, everything changes, which is pretty important why I titled my podcast Catholic Reboot. If we don't know what it was that they changed, as Catholics, we don't know what we lost. It's almost like our children right now are growing up in this pandemic. They're walking around in masks. They're told, you better go six feet distancing. And these poor kids have no clue. Who are they relying on? Us, the adults, to say, this is nonsense, okay? You don't lose all your rights because of a miracle virus that was created in order for you to do what? Lose your rights. Well, we lost our traditional Catholic Church rights in the 1960s, and most don't even know it. So, I'm going to discuss a very contentious topic, and that is Vatican II. And I'm going to do a very deep dive, and I really wanted to stay away from this because I didn't want a negativity to seep into this podcast. Uh, I wanted it to be more of an educational process, but what I realized is, how can we reboot if we don't know what we rebooted from, right? That's why this is most important. Now, this is going to probably take four episodes, because to do it right, I really do have to do the deep dive, and I will. But if you find no value after the first episode, or if you find no value halfway through this first episode, don't waste your time on the remaining episodes. And I will appropriately title them so you can say, nope, all the same subject matter, I don't want to know. But I will say, if you do stay through this entire series of episodes on this topic, then in essence, you have been educated. What you decide to do is up to you. I'm just explaining what I know the truth to be. And if anyone wanted to debate it, I will always have my email address there. I'm always up for a Zoom debate if that's necessary, okay? But it is very important that you start looking at what happened to your church. Now, I'm also doing this uh, for my children's generation because they had no involvement, they had no idea, they weren't even born for another 10 to 15 years, right? A lot of practicing Catholics uh, were just told by their grandparents and parents there once was a traditional Catholic church. The sad thing is uh, we owe a huge apology to our children and grandchildren um, because we should have done something. We should have stepped up against this miracle virus called Vatican II. All right, so now to get started, and I think I've given you enough time to decide to stop watching, right? So I'm not, I'm not into the clickbait at all, right? Uh, I just want to educate. All right, so 
one of the things I said in a previous episode was, and I think it was when I was explaining the elements of the Mass, that a lot of what we see in the Novus Ordo Mass um, was what they call pastoral. Again, let me explain what I mean by Novus Ordo. That the Novus Ordo Catholic Church is the church that came after Vatican II. So when I say Novus Ordo Mass, that's the Mass that was created after Vatican II. Okay. But what they did in the Council of Vatican II is for a couple years, once the Council was initiated, there were quite a few bishops and cardinals that were writing up documents uh, to discuss the proposed changes that needed to be made. Okay. And I had referred to a book, and it's really worth reading it. It's called Rhine Flows Into the Tiber. Okay. Why was it titled that way? Because the influences of the Rhineland countries, which were more liberal, right, countries, were influencing the more conservatives that were in where? Rome, which was the Tiber, right? Um, when you look at the step-by-step -step that went on during the council, what you'll see is the, nor the more liberal cardinals and bishops of that time knew that when they were going through those first two years of bringing together arguments and trying to debate it, they would have lost. And so what they needed to do is just simply get rid of them. Okay? What's that remind you of? When you want to have a change that you know it's inappropriate, just ignore the existing standards and get rid of them, right? Now I'm going to have an episode just on that, not as part of this series, but it's really important what were brought up and what were thrown out. All right. Now, uh, this council was considered pastoral because the prelates of the church, right, the, the bishops and cardinals, in communication with the pope, who at that time had just succeeded Pope John the Twenty Third, and it was Pope Paul the Sixth, realized anything they put their hand to, that if it is against the doctrine of the faith, doctrine of the faith, would be considered heretical. So they retitle, entitle the, the purpose of Vatican II as pastoral. What do we know about pastoral? Pastoral is just the, the process of providing things to help the faithful with their deposit of the faith. It's a, I would like to say it's a suggestion. It's not dogmatic. It's very important, and you need to know that. Okay, Why? Because then they could simply say, this is just nothing more than an experiment. And there were many experiments that came after Vatican II, of which didn't even exist in Vatican II, right? They even, the, the atrocious Council of Vatican II, uh, the, final, uh, the final document was still somewhat conservative, and then all the cardinals and bishops just went out and started under this pastoral mindset to just uh, willy-nilly start introducing things like the vernacular of the Mass was never part of Vatican II. The change of Gregorian chant was never part of Vatican II. All these other changes, they, they realized that if they could get away with that, they waited until after Vatican II and then into the 70s, they started slipping in all these other things, communion on the hand, the change in the confessional process, Okay, they just got away with it, so they just kept on going. Where do we see that today? If you're foolish enough to let your government get by with stripping you of your rights, then they learn and say, wow, we can just keep stripping them. This came out of Vatican II. They did exactly that then. Okay, and I'll, and I'll debate anybody that wants to debate that matter. These sneaky moves to get around the council, even when they council was at its basis false, okay? And now I'll get to <laughs> starting this episode. I have to give you this preface, otherwise you're going to think, what the heck is he talking about? All right. So when John Paul, I'm sorry, when Pope John the Twenty Third announced the creation of the Second Vatican Council, 
which is also known as Vatican II. He announced it in January 1959. Now this kind of shocked the world because there hadn't been an ecumenical council in over a hundred years, right? The last one was Vatican I under Pius IX, right? So everyone's kind of shocked as to what is the purpose of this council? What's he calling it for? Okay, so um, they called between 2,000 to 2,500 bishops and thousands of observers, auditors, sisters, laymen, laywomen, uh, to the four sessions of Vatican II. Now, right then and there, you have to say, the church ever do that before? Did they ever invite anyone other than cardinals and bishops or maybe certain specific fathers who had something to add? Never happened before. Observers? What are they observing? The only observer I give credit to is, is, is the one that wrote the book, Ryan Floats Into the Tiber, because it was well documented what was going on, right? The other thing they did is they invited um, Protestant ministers to the council. Why? You'll, you'll understand perfectly well why. Now, this all took place at St. Peter's Basilica, which is so significant, right? The seat of the church, right? And it went on between 1962 and 1965, okay? So for those years, they're doing all this, this writing and preparation and discussions and debates and then by 65, the council was closed, right? All right, we didn't actually see the effects of the council until 1969 and 1970, but officially the work was completed by 65. Now, what you have to remember is what was the culture of the time, right? So let's make it relevant to today. Um, how is it that we could get away with so dramatically changing our constitutional processes today? Because what we've learned is that when a culture is somewhat weakened or changed, okay, they're more apt to allow the change. So what was the culture and who was in place at this time? Well, it was the World War II generation. It was my parents' generation, or what they called the greatest generation, right? And and it, you can see that at the same time, um, uh, President Kennedy came into office in the United States. That was the generation, right? Well, what was it about the World War II generation? Well, they were different than their parents' generation. They had experienced quite a lot, and they they would be more likely to go for maybe a little bit more liberalization of the faith, right? Now, uh, these, what's important to know is the, the council itself, uh, there were 16 documents that came out laying the foundation for the church as, as, it's, as it's being practiced today, right? And the theme of the documents was reconciliation, right? Uh, now, they allowed uh, Catholics to pray uh, with other Christian denominations. They even encouraged friendship with other non-Christian faiths, and they opened the door for languages besides Latin to be used during the Mass. Now, they opened the door. That wasn't the final decree, but they planted those seeds. All right. If we know that this was the spirit, then what about the other new positions that would come out of it? And there were new positions regarding education, media, and divine revelation. So what's really important to understand, prior to this time, the church was almost seen as a fortress, right? And many people used that against the church. It's, it's almost similar to what we see with the United States. The very thing that made the United States so great, the liberals come in and try to make it look bad, right? Like what? Like these, uh, these, slave old, these slave holding old white men had nothing to do with did they create one of the greatest 
documents ever in human history. They had to slam it as being something, something not good, right? Same thing was happening here. They were saying the church is old. The church needs the update. But the church was, the church's view has always been that truth is truth. I mean, if you really want to say old, well, we go back 2,000 years with Christ. Did we negate Christ because he was from that old time of 2,000 years? No. Truth is truth. And so the church was a fortress, but it was a fortress of truth. So what was their concern? What did they profess their concern to be? Was, And even Pope John XXIII says he wants to open up the windows to let the fresh air in. And then later it was uh, said that he didn't let the fresh air in, he let the devil in. Even Pope Paul VI said the smoke of the devil is rising up through uh, the Vatican itself, right? So if we go back to that time before the council started doing its magic, the view of the church was always based on internal, internal stability and integrity and engaging the world more as a missionary activity, okay? In other words, the church proceeds out to the world. The world doesn't proceed into the church, right? Why? Because you're basically allowing Christ's church to be corrupted by humanism, right? Now, what John, Pope John wanted, or what he said he wanted, was to reinforce the missionary mandate, but he also wanted to create an environment of dialogue where the church would engage in all forces of the modern world, right? Scary, okay? And scary for the reason I explained before. Engage in what way and to what end are we going to engage? So when we look back at Vatican II, where it's a council that many, many popes prior to Vatican II cautioned us about, and many of the dictates made in the councils were forewarning, if this happens in the church, we're going to have significant destructions to our church, right? That's number one. The other thing to know is that... Um, Never before in our church history has a pope or a council contradicted previous popes or council. Never existed. And why is that? Because if we view the church as infallible, if a pope were to take the seat of Peter and say, you know what, everything we've been determining as our doctrine is false, then the church loses what? It loses its credibility as the body of Christ in its church. All of a sudden, Christ can never be non-truth. How could we be practicing for 2,000 years the untruth? Well, they were very creative on this. What they said is, no, it's not that. It's not that we're contradicting all these great minds uh, of the past. Is We think we want to just go back to the early times of Christians when things were much simpler. Well, that's false, because as we know in any development, it takes years to perfect, okay? My gosh, the original Christians, the original apostles were still in the temple. There wasn't even a technical Catholic church ceremony at the time. It takes time to perfect the Catholic church. So their first comment was false, okay? And, and it was not it was not debated. It, it should have been much thoroughly debated. All right. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to probably have to end this first episode just with this setup. Uh, but I want to I want to finish this, and then we'll go into everything I'm talking about. Uh, Pope Pius IX in 1864. And remember, Pope Pius IX was in the seat of Peter during what? Vatican I, right? But he had noticed at that time that there were certain things in our culture that were trying to infect the church. And he had issued what they called the syllabus of errors. And I'm just going to read those errors that he was not only condemning, 
but somewhat predicting were going to find their way into our church. And here they are. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall have come to him to be considered as true. Next one. Men can find the way to eternal salvation and reach eternal salvation in any form of religious worship. Where do we see that? Assisi with Pope John Paul II. Talking, we're talking hundreds of years before that happened. The next one is good hopes, at least, must be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who in no way belong to the true Church of Christ. Whoa. Truth outside Christ Church. Where do we see that? Protestant, Protestantism, 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 come on, Walt, is nothing else than a different form of the same true Christian religion. And in it, one can be pleasing to God, as is the case in the Catholic Church. Okay. Now, there you go. There can be two truths. You can be Protestant or you can be Catholic. You're both of the same truth. I've said in previous episodes, impossible. Christ Church is Christ Church. If Christ were over 21 other churches, he is committing adultery against his Catholic Church. Now, the main problem with, with the various religions of the world is that they don't accept divine revelation. And so... In regard to the Protestant church, they do not accept that all Christ has commanded uh, is present in the Catholic church. So, so our divine Savior was very specific in this. And I'm going to put up two biblical verses, and then I'm going to end this episode. Christ commanded his apostles to teach all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Matthew 28, uh, 19. Then Christ said, He who is baptized and believes will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Okay. This is where I'm going to end it. Let it soak in. Okay. We go to the next series. I'm going to list 25 examples of what they put in Vatican II uh, was a contradiction to what the church had believed prior to that. Okay? And that sets up a great debate. So, thanks for getting through this much of it. Again, you don't want to watch anymore. You were forewarned. 